thank you for carving some time to be uh, with us this morning. We're live on our streaming platform, East Texas Now, and we're um, uh, as we were waiting to get connected, I was kind of just giving some context on uh, this case, uh, a little refresher for people in our area, uh, even though, I mean, if, if you know, you were in this area back in, you know, 2016, 2017, and again in 2021 when the trial was happening, it was really hard to miss because this was kind of, uh, at least for us, this was covering our newscast uh, for, a, you know, a pretty substantial amount of time. And so um, before we get into kind of the case and the episode that just came out today, uh, could you give us uh, some background on yourself? I understand you're a criminologist uh, and a professor as well. Yeah, I have been studying criminology uh, for 15 years. Um, one of my uh, primary areas of uh, study is in psychological and developmental criminology. Um, I try to understand why people become these offenders. And if that we have that knowledge, how can we help police to solve crime or ultimately to do the things that we need to do to prevent these crimes from happening? Gotcha. And... Um... This new show, it's out um, today, actually. I stayed up way past my bedtime last night at 11 o'clock when it came out to watch it. Um, it's a really, really fascinating show. I've never really seen anything like it because you work uh, with your students to kind of examine these crimes and really get into kind of the mindset of these criminals. Um, so how did you approach this case? Kind of how did you find it? Um, and what was kind of um, just your first impression when you were learning about it? Well, first of all, thank you so much for watching the show. Uh, you're the first viewer I've ever uh, known, so thank you for that. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, it is a really unique show, and it, one of the reasons why I, I wanted to do it is because it's so unique and different. Um, I, as a professor and a former FBI agent, I was constantly asked, you know, is Mindhunter and Criminal Minds or Law and Order, you know, the major shows that people see on TV, are those real? And is that how it's really done? And I would spend so much of my day saying, no, that's not real. That's just TV. You know, that's not how it's really done. And so I actually taught a class at uh, the University of South Florida, where I work, on forensic psychology. And the entire idea was, how is this really occurring? I worked in the FBI's behavioral science unit. I've worked in um, with police departments. And the entire idea is, what do we really do? And how can I train my students to do what the police really need to solve crimes or policymakers and practitioners need to help prevent these crimes from happening? So when I started teaching these classes, I realized, wow, maybe actually this could be used as a TV show to help educate, you know, the public on what we do, but also the public can learn the red flags and the things that we look for so they can spot these things in their own lives. Mm -hmm. And we'll get more into kind of the, the mindset of William Davis later because as you know and as I know, he's not kind of your traditional, you know, serial killer, so to speak. Um, so when you were first kind of examining this case, um, what were some things that stood out to you, um, first impressions of the case? Number one is, and I, I always try to train my students on this, people think that all serial killers are psychopaths or that, you know, they, they come out of dark, scary, you know, corners or bushes and they jump out at you and, you know, that's the thing that you need to be afraid of. Um, the thing that this case most taught me and was most astonishing is Will Davis was such an upstanding citizen. Uh, he's likable. Uh, when I went on to, when I went to death row to interview him, as you guys will see on the show, he starts, you know, cracking jokes with me. He's very affable. Um, I interviewed his mother, who was just a, a very sweet woman. Um, and so he came from a place that you would have never expected a serial killer to come out of. And he doesn't act like a serial killer or think like a serial killer in terms of the outward signs. Mm -hmm. And in terms of um, the details of what exactly happened in the hospital was there anything uh that stood out to you that was particularly jarring during you know what the events that happened in 2016 and 2017 the hospital was phenomenal in that they saw a pattern and they worked with um detective roberts who is also incredible on this case and were willing to look at data and facts to kind of put together these what could just be played off as, you know, aberrations. Oh, well, you know, things happen, you know, mistakes happen or, you know, people die unexpectedly. And they could have just written it off as such. But um, Detective uh, Roberts and, you know, others that were working on this case said, no, you know, that's not what's going on here. And the hospital, to their credit, said, 
we're going to investigate that. And if they didn't do that, this could have turned into a string of murders that I've seen actually in my life growing up. I grew up in Allentown, Pennsylvania, where we had a man who was a nurse um, who killed they think upwards of you know over 40 people um and so this was able to be halted before it really became you know a lot worse and and the people that died there's that's not to downplay it there shouldn't have been any but um because of the hospital's actions and because of the detective they were able to really stop this before it got even worse yeah and really um when we were covering this case, you know, as I said, 2016, 2017, 2021, when the trial happened, uh, the thing that makes these kind of cases so kind of unique is because, there, especially in this one, there's not necessarily like that so-called smoking gun. We don't see him on security camera, you know, injecting someone. And so there's so many puzzle pieces that kind of have to be put together by uh, these investigators. We know, well, what do we know? Okay, we know that they all happened overnight. So that kind of clears out the day shift. And uh, once the security cameras are installed, after a certain point, I believe they were installed either late 2016, early 2017, and that kind of brought upon, you know, this demise um, of William Davis, because before that, really, there there wasn't a whole lot of evidence that kind of pointed in his direction, um, and as it goes into in the, um, the episode, that uh, people were, you know, shocked, and he maintained, you know, that innocence the entire time. Um, no one wanted to believe that this could happen here, and, you know, Tyler, Texas, where, you know, th these kinds of things don't happen all that often. And so I guess kind of um, my question, uh, my long-winded question is, um, is kind of for your students, how do you approach, you know, a, a, a scenario like this where it just seems so far-fetched and the, the goal of prosecution might seem, you know, difficult? Well, Again, the hospital was so smart and how fast they acted and the fact that they were using data and technology to try to collect evidence that wasn't, you know, the normal things, DNA at the scene or blood spatter or the kind of things that they're so used to having to connect people to murders. So I really applaud them for that. Um, but what they were looking for was not necessarily the smoking gun, but you know, the, they were limiting down their pool of suspects, which is really smart. Um, and then it led to Will Davis. Who was this, you know, the, the last person many people would think of as being possible to be responsible for these murders? So one thing I always teach my students is do not judge books by their cover. It is so that's the number one blind spot that I see police have. We get focused on one suspect. We think it's this person. And even though you may get that initial gratification of, you know, closing the case. If you get the wrong person, that means the real person who was responsible for the crimes is out there, able to offend, to commit more crimes, to harm more people. So even though the facts you know, led to Will Davis, people were open-minded enough to say, he doesn't seem like he could do this, but they thought, wow, let's dig into this. And it really, you know, as you'll see, you know, it, it was him. And I think it really shows that anyone could be a potential offender. We really, you can't judge that book by the cover. You have to start looking deeper at those psychological traits and risk factors. And that's really what I train my students to do. And I think that's what the show does so well is kind of digging deep into, you know, the background of uh, William Davis going all the way back to, you know, childhood and, you know, kind of taking a hard look at that and thinking, okay, you know, there was, there was, you know, stress in the family, there was financial struggles. Um, and one thing that I thought was uh, really great in the show is um, you mentioned to your students, you know, how many of you guys have had stresses or difficulties or hardships uh, in your lifetime, but you haven't killed anybody? And I think that was um, a part that especially stood out to me because, I mean, so many people go through these same things that William Davis was dealing with, anxiety, depression, um, problems with, with um, medication, um, various other things that so many people deal with but he still went ahead and did this and that's uh, i mean for us in this area kind of coming to grips and trying to find the motive has been so difficult because really it, for so long it seemed unexplainable until you know i watched this and it started actually kind of making sense to me and i've spent a lot of time on this case um but uh and you also interviewed him you went down to um the Polensky unit down in um, Livingston. Kind of tell me about that experience. I, I've done an interview at death row and I know walking up just alone is just a little, a little spooky. So tell me about that experience. It's, I mean, just first of all, for anyone who hasn't walked into a jail or death row, you know, it is indescribable and death row in itself just has an eerie 
haunting feeling that, um, you know, I, I've, since I've, I've been on many and you'll never be able to shake, but, you know, walking there, it was almost, um, you know, you're catching up with your thoughts, trying to think about, you know, what, what am I going to ask him? And you don't have a lot of time. That was the other real constraint. Uh, I was given an hour on the nose. So all the questions I wanted to ask him and all the things, you know, I had to do, build a rapport, get him to trust me, get him to understand, you know, I'm, I'm also trying to understand him, which a lot of times I've learned, um, people that commit these crimes, they're also confused. Like, why did I do this? It's not like they're so aware, like, oh, I have you know, this issue from childhood or I was stressed out, you know, they don't understand it. So I was trying to convey to him, like, I need to understand you for my own, you know, needs, but I also want to understand you so I can explain it to you and you can help understand this more. And so walking in there and just how, you know, eerie it is that every single person in there, you know, has done crimes so severe that led them to be on Texas death row. That's always haunting. But Will, you know, when you walk in, the first thing you do is sit down and talk to him. He's making jokes. He's so affable, likable. I mean, almost within a few seconds, I was able to, you know, just have a, I wouldn't say normal conversation, but as you'll see on the show, we just have a, a conversation. And I, I think you'll see, I know I don't want to have any spoilers, but he really was, uh, I think, um, and trusting and really just wanted his story to be out there. And I think we were able to ask the right questions to make that happen. How do you balance, you know, tr having, you know, this lighthearted conversation, you know, he's cracking jokes, uh, you know, just being himself, I guess you could say, um, while also, you know, in the back of your mind, you know that this person has killed multiple people. Um, is it kind of hard to, you know, just kind of figure out how to, act in that situation because I know for me it was I think a natural human reaction is you know when you're first meeting someone is you know to smile and you know say, say greetings and things like that so I guess kind of how did you approach that well it is difficult and I did have a lot of training on interviewing uh, and interrogation so I, I have some you know background that helped me with this but you know the thing that always helped me when I was an FBI agent is you can't think about the crime. You have to think about your goals because every single time I'd be interviewing someone who committed, you know, crimes against children or, you know, commit, you know, murder or things that just to me were, you know, sexual assault, things that were so hard for me to think about and I would struggle with every time it came into my head. I just, you know, for the goal of what I was trying to achieve, which was to get the truth, to get some facts, to try to understand the person. You have to separate that. And though it sounds, you know, like, oh, I'm being lighthearted and I'm giving him what he wants or I'm able to engage in this, you know, nice conversation with him. It was for a goal. And that goal was to better serve, you know, society, right? We had some information come out that we didn't know before. That was a worthy goal. And then for, in general, to understand why someone like Will Davis could have done something like this. Now that we have that information, we're better suited to try to do things to prevent it if we see this ever come about again. When you went into the interview, you had some things that you knew you wanted to get out of it, some things you wanted to ask him. What were those things that you wanted to make sure that you asked him or wanted to get out of that interview? Well, the first hands down was, you know, what in his mind made him commit these crimes because that you know was essentially the goal of the show but also what like you said so many people in Tyler Texas were wanting to know so um even you know people I interviewed that were very close that knew him for years and years and years said I don't understand this please help me and so it was in a way to bring a little more closure to this um another was you know were there more victims and it was just an uh, unanswered question we as you've seen the show put together some timelines, we're just constructing some you know, data points and trying to understand was every single person that law enforcement knew about, you know, the, the only people that, you know, Will Davis had uh, ultimately killed. And I won't uh, have any spoilers, but that was another big question. Um, and then a third one was just, you know, what, what does, you know, he think about this now? Because, you know, there's a lot of questions about, you know, a psychopath doesn't feel remorse and grief and, you know, those types of emotions. So for me to really probe that and to understand, you know, is he somebody that was, you know, just who went on a really bad path and maybe could have been, you know, saved, or was it just, you know, those rare cases where there's just 
no you know redemption they just do not seem to have any you know solace and there's no, nothing that we can bring back um and i was surprised that will at least showed you know remorse he he acted upset um and we can go into and debate you know the the validity of that and and we actually in the show do talk about this you know is does he really feel remorse or is he just that good at faking it and maybe some other people are just bad at faking it and they show no remorse and they don't even know they're supposed to um but for will at least he did show it and um you know we can debate whether or not it was truthful Absolutely. And I mean, this is a person, I mean, like many criminals that are, are known for lying. And so they can say all day, you know, I'm sorry for what I did. I'm remorseful. But I mean, to a victim's family, I mean, I, I'm not sure how much weight that can carry. I, I don't want to speak on their behalf. But um, and you, you, you also talked with some of the victims uh, in the show, victims' families. Uh, this is really such a good show, you guys. You really need to watch it because the interviews are fantastic. The interviews, they interview William Davis's mom, his ex-wife. Uh, you guys really did a good job of, you know, getting all these people that are so ingrained in his life uh, and the people that were impacted, you know, by his crimes. Um, and so, uh, again, without spoiling anything, the he is very truthful with you in the interview. Were you, were you kind of surprised by that and kind of, you know, again, trying to, without saying too much, admitting, you know, to the things that he did? Is, is that surprising to you? So that does go to when I said that, you know, he he showed remorse. It wasn't just that he said it right. It was and this is part of the you know, sort of the, the art of this uh, when it comes to, you know, these psychological profiles, trying to understand, you know, if he's just saying one thing, is he going through the motions or are there more supporting facts? And when you're looking at the totality of the circumstances and the fact that he was very forthcoming about other things and the fact that he was truthful and did, you know, finally come clean about things that he had done. Um, that made me think that in general, it was sort of like he's he's willing to kind of face the face the music of who he was and what he did and how bad he hurt people. Nothing he can say will ever you know undo the harm he caused to those victims and that family. And you know, even talking to his mother, I mean the pain that she felt, uh, his you know his ex-wife, his children, that pain is, there's nothing that will come through this show or anything that he can say that will ever make that go away. And that's another thing we're you know, trying to grapple with here. How do you handle all the victims? And there's an entire community too. People that were afraid to go to the hospital, afraid to get you know, life-saving help and treatment because of the trust that was broken because of this action. So um, one thing we're trying to do again is prevention because the best crime is the one that never happened. So by using what Will told us, we're hoping we can turn that into preventative measures, earlier identification and warning systems. When we see people that are, you know, on the edge or hospitals when they have, you know, data, they can start plotting when people are, you know, mysteriously dying. So it doesn't get to four or five victims. We can really make sure this happens, hopefully at zero, but you know, to really make sure we catch it even sooner. Absolutely. And one of the more difficult things about this case is, well, I don't think we'll ever really know for sure exactly how many victims there were because he was convicted on four. And then in the punishment phase of the trial, which I was in for every single day, of, by the way, for a month straight, this was a month long trial. If you if you missed it back in 2021, um, more victims were brought up during the punishment phase and victims that, um, you know, are wheelchair bound now and, you know, lives have been completely changed. Um, and so kind of just to wrap up, I'm curious what your assessment of William Davis is as a criminologist. You know, this person who, uh, you know, had a very normal childhood, didn't necessarily come from, you know, a broken home, as you mentioned, where a lot of, you know, serial killers kind of, you know, kind of, you know, I don't want to say like get their start, but, you know, kind of the domino stop, start falling, you know, whether they come from a broken home, they have, you know, difficult teenage years. So what's your assessment of someone who is capable of such a heinous crime like this, um, but still, you know, had a relatively normal upbringing? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Uh, so the, 
we did debate this quite a bit as we were going through the show. And and it's not like just because I do this for a living or I was an FBI agent, you know, I instantly have all of the answers. And I think that's one thing you see during the show. We really grapple with a lot of these questions. And I want people to understand the process. It's not like you see on TV where they, you know, stand over the crime scene and instantly have the accurate profile. That, that never happens. Um, but to answer yours, the big takeaway is people have to understand there's not one profile of what makes a, a serial killer where they don't fit neatly in those boxes of like a psychopath. Um, you have people that could be walking amongst us and you would never think could be capable of these types of crimes or take serial killing off the table. How about, you know, abusing their kids or lying and stealing at work or, or doing things that are it's just harmful to society. People are capable of these things. And so little things matter. And finding those those small aberrations and, and noticing them and putting them together and putting weight into them. I'm not saying to be paranoid and walk around at all times like everyone's bad. But when you start noticing things accumulating, it's really important to number one say, you know, what can we do to help? Or then report it to people that can help. There's really no downside to doing this because you may be able to intervene and save, if not that person who's you know maybe in in crisis or struggling, you could straight save whoever they may be harming. And I always think you know, erring on that side of caution is is always my, what I preach. But as you'll see also in future episodes, every single person that's in here, nobody who is happy and healthy, goes on to commit these types of crimes. Nobody. So there's something that's going on either in their life or in their mind that makes them do this. So when you can start spotting those things, we're able to intervene or at least, you know, catch them sooner. Yeah, this is certainly a crime that none of us here in Tyler will be forgetting anytime soon. Dr. Brianna Fox, thank you so much for making some time to chat with us about the show. It really is a great one. I'm very excited to watch the next two episodes. Uh, it's so well done, such a neat little kind of, it's so different from normal, you know, crime shows. Uh, and I think that's what I really like about it. The show is called The Lesson is Murder. You can find it on Hulu. It is out now. Dr. Fox, thank you so much.